Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Science of SaaS Startups podcast. Today, I'm talking to Armando Biondi. So Armando is the, the CEO and the co-founder of Breadcrumbs. They're a, a seed-funded SaaS-based uh, revenue acceleration engine. Armando, welcome. Hey, thank you for having me. So I just want to start off by asking a, a couple of quick questions just to help the, the audience get to know you as a person uh, a little bit better. So we'll start off with a, a nice, easy one. So what, what's your favorite country to visit? Uh, well, obvious reasons, Italy. Uh, when I have some time, I tend to want to go back a couple of weeks or three to you know, chill a bit and enjoy good food. And I noticed you live in a lot of different countries like, over the years. Like, where, where do you love? What's your favorite country to live? You know, that they're, they're kind of pros and cons to different places, or, or do you feel one is yeah. a, a real leader? There are always pros and cons. Uh, I would say the U.S. From a, I think like current current state for me is good enough. I, I live in the U.S. I've been living here for the past ten years now, and then on a yearly basis, maybe like twice a year, I, I go back to Italy to slow down a bit, but business side mostly is in, in the US. And then I've spent some time in Spain, where I lived in Barcelona for a year, some time in Canada, I lived in Vancouver for about a year as well. Um, but yeah, I think um, depending on what you want to focus on, um, yeah, countries do have trade-offs. Yeah, I guess, as, you know, in your line of work as an entrepreneur and like the tech world, you know, the US has a, a gravity to it, doesn't it? But I, I definitely see that changing. You know, we see more and more companies coming out of Europe now, don't we? In this yeah, uh, Europe has been very interestingly active from that standpoint, both more and more companies as well as more and more investments and higher and higher valuations and more capital deployed in Europe as well. And it is true that you know everywhere when it comes to technology, particularly there is this like more distributed approach compared to before. You know, following last year lockdowns and you know shenanigans, for which people you know decided to mostly go back to their roots or you know take the opportunity to travel to someplace else. Um, I also think that there is you know the that attraction law, uh, that gravity toward like tier one type of hubs is going to continue. So like in New York or uh, San Francisco, when it comes to certain type of founders, certain type of technology companies, um, that's going to be hard to beat still. Yeah, so you, you don't see the kind of push to, to remote working and working from home affecting that, that the power of network still too strong, is it? I think so. Uh, and the other thing that I've been thinking about and I don't know to which degree this is like controversial versus people are starting to realize this more and more. The office as a venue has a value, right? And so there is a reason why it existed so far. Uh, and most people, like last year, there was all this conversation around, yes, everything remote, everything distributed. But now what you're seeing is more and more companies that are starting to want to have people back. And more and more people that are starting to want to go back. Um, and what is going to be interesting to me is like this shift between having to be at the office like all day, every day, which arguably wasn't necessarily the case anymore, even before last year, but not too many companies realized that. So from being a mandatory type of thing every time, all the time to being more of a social venue from a, like, a, like a corporate social venue where you have the opportunity to do things that you cannot do at home, plain and simple, right? Um, you know, the serendipitous type of encounters, the social stuff, like bumping into that colleague that you haven't seen for like a quarter at the coffee machine or, you know, uh, having drinks and discovering that there is this interesting project going on of which you had no idea. That stuff doesn't happen over, over Zoom, right? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and what are your what are your interests outside of work? Like, what, what do you like to do for fun? Um, you know, mostly the the usual stuff, uh, movies and and you know some some Netflix, and then lots of social time. So you know, circle of friends, um, restaurants, uh, drinks, um, exercising a bit, just to keep keeping sane, and that's about it. Yeah. 
And what, what is something that everybody else loves that you just don't get at all? Like whether that be movies or sport or TV or fashion? Sport. <laughs> all sport. Yeah, I, I, I could not watch any kind of sport. I was like, oh, why am, am I doing this? <laughs> <laughs> so you're not, not, watching, not watching Italy and the Euros at the moment then? No, 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 I'm not. <laughs> the only thing I watch is the Super Bowl. That's it. <laughs> okay. All, All right. right. You're true American now then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and the last one on this is what, um, what aspect of your personality has got you in the most trouble in the past? Uh, I, I tend to have contrarian opinions and I'm not shy about them. <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, not everyone is comfortable or accepting and or, and or sometimes you can ruffle some feathers the wrong way. Um, and so that, that happened a few times in the past. Okay. So if we uh, jump into breadcrumbs, um, so this is a, an early stage business. Um, you raised just a little under five and a half million dollars um, fairly recently. Do you, do you want to yeah. give us an overview of the company and, and what you're trying to do? For sure, absolutely. Um, it's the, the company is the result of a series of observations, mainly around the idea of revenue as a joint responsibility between marketing sales and success and this macro trend of roles at the intersection of functions within organizations with you know the whole mandate and the responsibility to just make things work specifically if you think about ops you know revenue ops marketing and sales ops companies will never not have a crm will never not have a marketing automation solution will never not have a product engagement solution and yet there is no glue and greasing between each and every one of these technology stacks and so what happens is that for most companies different pieces of information get scattered across different databases which are not really talking to each other and so companies are not really able to action those uh, signals in a meaningful and timely way and so the idea behind breadcrumbs is is that uh, so we started with lead scoring as it was meant to be um, or like uh, this concept of lead scoring to 2.0 and we are evolving into this idea of the logic layer on top of your go-to-market stack, enabling companies to maximize revenue opportunities, capturing these signals in a timely and effective way so that you can actually react to them as a company. So in the past in this industry, we've seen uh, like lead scoring involving like very expensive consultants and very long lead uh, implementation times, like weeks and months. And with breadcrumbs, like you're talking about lead scoring in real time, like and building yeah. on it, building models in, in minutes. So, so how, how are you able to achieve that? Yeah, you're, you're spot on. And surprisingly, this is still the case for most companies trying to tackle any, any kind of scoring model. And the, re the reason for that is related to the fact that most companies so far and most operators have been tackling this from a process perspective not from a product perspective and so if you think about lead scoring this is like a feature set which is at this point table stakes but always that you know kind of bare bone barely good enough but not really type of thing which is available everywhere but not really core for anyone and because of that that doesn't end up being a great solution for almost any company. And so what they do, like companies tend to try those, you know, uh, bare bone versions and then quickly discover that those are not doing the job. And so they um, engage with consultants and end up in that, you know, months long and very expensive type of process to pretty much reinvent the wheel most of the times. And so we are taking a different approach there in the sense that we are productivizing all that knowledge and doing all that work ahead of time. So that you as a company, when you're ready, you just have to plug in your sources of, of data, your you know, tech stack, 
and then you can design and create the model in a few seconds, really, for like minutes, um, and you're good to go. And so instead, like the outcome of that is that instead of, instead of having a model like four months after having, having started working on it, you can have it tomorrow. And the other thing which we discovered along the way is that most companies, once that they build this first version, because it's so time consuming and so frustratingly annoying, and you never really know whether it's doing anything at all, and it costs it so much, they, after they complete the project, they leave it at that. But if you look at the most sophisticated operators, the way they do it, you know, building one of those models is just the starting point. So after that, you want to iterate on those models to make them better and tweak them depending on how things change in the market or with your customer base or with you as a company from a strategic perspective. Um, and you also want to have different models for different purposes and different life cycle stages of the customer journey. If you think about the most successful and sophisticated companies out there from this perspective, most of them, at a minimum, they have a model for acquisition purposes, one model for retention purposes, one model for cross-sell and upsell purposes, if you're a B2B company, right? And all those models run in parallel. And then you have one model which is active and a bunch of other models which are testing in the background to see whether some kind, some set of assumptions is working better than some other, in which case you just swap one model for the other. And so building this kind of infrastructure is like years of work and only the most sophisticated companies out there really get there. And so the idea behind Breadcrumb say, you know, do that in advance for everyone else so that they can just, you know, plug and play and get started and tweak and test and iterate right away. And not only, you know, enterprise, more mature companies can have this as a, you know, um, capacity or ability within their operational infrastructure, but every, everyone else as well. So mid-stage or early stage companies as well. Because another one of the observations, just to wrap it up on this one, is that what companies don't realize most of the times is that they're actually leaving money on the table by not being able to capture these signals in a timely way and reacting to them as timely. Like if you think about, you know, any operator will tell you that following up on a promising lead today or tomorrow versus like three weeks from now, it's fundamentally different, mm -hmm. right? And yet this is yeah. really not personalized in any way. And that's a capital scene in the B2B world. But in general, you know, in running a company, you never want to leave money or revenue opportunities on the table. You want to try and capture as many as possible, as effectively as possible. Yeah, no, I think it sounds like a really compelling message, you know, for a huge number of companies, you know, when you think you can, um, you know, almost leapfrog like the years that, that some of these bigger companies have been building these models. And, and how do you see yourselves like growing the business? I know like one of your previous ventures was like very marketing led and, you know, less on the direct sales side. Do you see this being a direct sale or like a partner network that you will build? Or? Yeah. Uh, all of those, uh, so one of the things which is also very interesting to me um, is that most of the buzzword today is around PLG, right? Product-led growth, you hear this all the time, yeah. everywhere, by pretty much, you know, anyone. Um, but mo the most sophisticated oper operators know that it's never an or-or conversation, it's more of an end end conversation you want to have a marketing driven um, gtm and then a sales driven gtm and then a product driven gtm or a, you know product plus marketing plus sales so that's how we are thinking about the world there as well with you know ad espresso which is the company we're referring to which was really mostly marketing driven there was a conscious decision because of the peculiar space we were playing in at the time uh, but we totally see the opportunity for breadcrumbs uh, to have all three of the motions that we talked about, as well as like a partner um, related type of activity there. Yeah. Okay. And in, with this market, I mean, how do you see it evolving over the next year to two years? I mean, you mentioned, you know, you, you kind of see breadcrumbs as being that, that kind of logic layer. Are there kind of more things you want to do in, in terms of the, the next step of product development? 
Yeah, absolutely. The, the idea, so there are a couple of very interesting things that we are thinking about, which is really the bet behind the bet, right? One bet is this concept of, you know, emerging roles, the ops related roles, you know, rev ops or marketing and sales ops, you know, that is a category of operators that's really starting to uh, be a thing right now, right? Companies are realizing that they should have an ops person or as they go through a certain level of maturity and experience some kind of pains, that's where it lands usually. And we think this is one of those uh, macro trends which is going to continue for many, many years now. If you think about also revenue as a joint responsibility between marketing and sales, you know, a chief revenue officer or a VP of revenue or a chief growth officer, these roles are all the way to the top. And really, they didn't really exist too much, even five years ago, if you think about yeah. it, right? So that's one thing. And the other thing is that we, the, one of the bets behind this is that going back to that idea of CRM and marketing automation, so the tech stack is becoming more complicated for companies and it's never going to go back. It's, not, it's never gonna be simpler again. Uh, it's going to be even more complicated in the future because there are going to be more point solutions doing a better job at specific things compared to the big, you know, platforms that are available out there, like the HubSpot, the Marketo, the Salesforce of the situation. They are not going to uh, go away by any means. Those platforms are growing, they're investing heavily, uh, but there's, their role is changing in the sense that you, if you squint, you can see unbundling the, the job of storing the data versus acting on the data or like moving the data around. Those things up to very recently were, doing by, were, were done by like the HubSpot, the Salesforce of the world. And that is changing. And so you see like storing data as a specific functions, slash jobs, slash company, you see moving data, organizing data, and you see companies focused specifically on or protecting data. Um, and uh, another element of it <clears throat> is actioning data. And so, you know, once that you've done all those things that you're storing the data somewhere, you're moving the data appropriately, and you're capturing the data, and you're protecting the data, and you're organizing and rationalizing and, you know, letting insights emerge, you know, the, the other part of the equation is, that's all great, but what do you do with that? Right? Yeah. So, and so with breadcrumbs, we are, we like to think about us as one of the first companies that's emerging, taking care of that actionable, you know, time sensitive layer, uh, like really dispatching, you know, the, the, the data and the opportunities, either customers or leads in a way that companies can react on the signals in a timely way. It's a concept that we call digital body language and digital reflexes, right? Your customers slash opportunities are sending you signals, which is that digital body language type of idea. And like you can only act on them if you have this, you know, digital reflexes type of approach where, you know, you get signal, you react on it and you do something about it and at a scale you know, uh, level when you think about having, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of customers, it cannot really be any other way. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. And, and so if we just like dig in a little bit into like the startup life, um, you know, I'm interested in, you know, how the idea for, for this company came around, you know, is this just something that slowly emerged out of a series of informal conversations or is it, was there a purpose and a drive from, from the very beginning? It was really me as the initiator of this. Uh, one of the things that we didn't mention is I'm, I'm also an angel investor in more than 150 companies at this point. So I've been you know, relatively active on that side. Um, and uh, because of my background and expertise, I've always lived at the intersection between growth, revenue, and operations. And um, one of the 
it, like the the trigger for this was when we sold that espresso to Hootsuite, which was my previous company. Um, they embarked on this huge project to build their own like flywheel engine lead scoring and customer scoring system, which took them like six months and several hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so I started realizing that this, like, this was still a problem on one side, and it was very uh, compartmentalized, like there was a clear divide between companies not being sophisticated about this at all, and existing solutions not really being a solution uh, in the sophisticated way for this and a very small percentage of very sophisticated operators that were doing this over and over again as a process back to what we were saying before. And so that to me speaks about a clear opportunity because if you can distill that knowledge into a product and make it available for everyone else to get to the same outcome with like a tenth, a hundred of the effort and the knowledge, that's a clear win, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you mentioned you spent quite a lot of time as a, an angel investor, as well as a, an entrepreneur. Like, what, what do you see as being the common mistakes that, that founders tend to, to fall into? Um, more in general or around the area? Or like around yeah. this stuff? Yeah, more in general. I, I'm just thinking for like startup founders. You know what? You know what? What advice is an investor? Because you've said both yeah. both of those sides. You know what? What, what do you think, see is? Um, I think it really depends on the stage that you are talking about. If it's like the startup stage versus like if you're in the in the validation mode, um, if you're fundraising, if you are. You know, it's zero to five customers and then five to 20 and then 20 to 100 and then 100 to 1,000 and then 1,000 to five, 10,000. All different phases have different do's and don'ts. Um, so like a little bit hard to generalize the, the thing, like, but maybe the one soundbite is that Every founder thinks about their company as a very special and unique snowflake. Uh, yeah. That is that. That baby. For, yeah. For most companies, most of the knowledge as well as the expertise needed to solve that specific problem has been codified by now, which is the reason why business school exists, right? And so... There is an insight there which is unique. There is a perspective there which is, you know, hopefully counterintuitive and special, which you know is the reason for that company to exist. But innovating on everything is too hard, uh, and so a company should innovate on that just on just that one thing, and then use playbooks and best practices for everything else. And most founders, I find, or a lot of them, tend to want to be stuck in that you know mindset of innovate everywhere and we're very special uh in everything and that doesn't play out most of the time super well because again it's hard enough to innovate on one thing um and so you use playbooks and best practices whenever available which is 95 percent of the times yeah no, I mean, anytime I don't know anything, you know, a quick Google and trying to find somebody else's experience is, you know, always the right. first place to try. And I heard you talking recently about um, relationships with investors and board members as being harder to get out of than a marriage. And, um, and I thought as, you know, as human beings, we tend to think quite a lot about what makes a good marriage and, and what would be good to look for there. And I wondered if you had any advice about, you know, what we or what founders should look for in an investor to make sure they get a good marriage? Right, that's a very good question and, and good news for capturing that. It's a hard question. Uh, I still, I do think quite a bit to that and I still don't have a perfectly good answer to it, except it really is harder than a marriage to get out of and so you should be extremely picky about who you let in on your board if you can choose. If you cannot choose, it's a different conversation. And you know that's, that's a different conversation around how do you put yourself in a position to be able to choose. 
and how do you build optionality for you to be able to do that? Uh, but really is, you know, be picky. Um, the other thing which is somehow counterintuitive and maybe contrary and maybe it will, going back to that, you know, ruffling feathers the wrong way sometimes, there is this idea from most founders that investors know more um, about the space or about the industry or about technology or about the VC or like, you know, about their company than they do. Or, and that is generally not the case I found. And uh, here's my like counterpoint. If they were that smart and if they had that special insight and they have access to capital, they would have started the company themselves. And most of the times they don't do that, right? Uh, and you know, it's more nuanced than that because there is an element around diversifying risk and you know, being all in, invested in one thing versus a bunch of others and different people have different appetites for risk. But if they were that bullish, if they were that certain, if they knew that much, and if they had that special insight, they would have started the company themselves and they did not. They are investing in founders instead, right? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it's and VCs are a great part of the startup and venture game. They are very necessary, but it's important to know, you know, the the perimeter of the relationship and you know what's your job versus what their job and uh, what are the boundaries there. And when to trust yourself and and, and what you're doing, yeah. So I know um, you started having the conversations like around breadcrumbs during the, this kind of pandemic and, you know, a hundred year sort of virus, you know, that, that we, we kind of experience at the moment. I, I wondered, you know, how much that made you reflect on, you know, your own playbook in terms of, you, you know, you've done several successful startups before. Is there anything you felt you needed to adapt this time in, into the kind of different world that, that we live in now? Uh, not really. And we're going back to normal. Like uh, the only thing that was different about this virus was the reaction to it from my perspective. And again, uh, different topic for a different <laughs> time. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't, yeah, I mean, it was very clear to me that it was something like the aberration was the reaction to it as a society to this thing uh, because viruses have existed forever, right? Um, and um, so things would go back to normal at some point. Um, and so, yeah, it, no, it was more of a temporary, which is happening right now, which I'm very happy about. To me, it was more the, the weird thing, like the past year and a half, like all that nonsense, whatever. Um, but yeah. So it didn't kind of change any of the fundamentals for you then? It was just kind of trust and, and move forward? No, and there is this thing about markets, you know, one, one of the things about being an entrepreneur and a founder is that you have to be adaptable uh, and you have to be mindful and be aware of the fact that really the only constant is change. Um, and so in that sense, things are going to change all the time, either it's macroeconomic conditions or it's your competitor or it's one of, you know, the big tech I don't know, uh, Facebook or Google or Apple or Amazon or Microsoft doing something, or maybe it's something internal and, you know, your team or product or, you know, customers, there is always something going on in that sense. So, um, yeah, we're just one very weird moment in time um, for, yeah, but that was it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm mindful of your time. So I've just got one one last question, and, and just again, you know, advice for kind of other founders in in the kind of startup space is when when you're looking at those first, you know, hires, the the kind of first 10, 20 hires, and obviously, you know, you're interested in skill set and someone who's got the experience to to do a job that you're looking for, but beyond the skill set, you know, what what are the the characteristics? you know, that you need in that kind of early team around you? First and foremost, like the single most important thing is culture fit there. So like beyond the skill set, which of course is important because one person is hired to do something uh, and they yeah. never perform. Uh, it's really the culture fit. 
uh, with regards to the the belief system as well as the the way to think about things. This is also another piece of like counterintuitive slash partially contrarian advice that they often talk about. Um, the best people that have been working with in the past like 10 plus years doing technology are people that have a set of ethics similar to mine and a belief system similar to mine, but very complementary expertise and skill set so that we think about problems fundamentally in the same way we behave about situations in the same way but then we complement each other from like a skill set knowledge expertise perspective and standpoint yeah okay well it's been great having you on armando and thank you for joining us today um if people yeah. want to get in touch with you to discuss breadcrumbs is like you know linkedin or, or email the best way uh, anything works so armando at uh, breadcrumbs.io it's my email or linkedin like facebook the socials i'm very active there so feel free to reach out yeah perfect okay well i really appreciate your time and look forward to, to kind of seeing the, the next stage of growth for you over the, the coming years